your book, one thing that struck me, you interviewed Hosni Mubarak, I believe in, mm. was it, how was that? Just Scary, he had a really powerful handshake and it was straight after 9-11 and the guy was already about 70, maybe older, I think. And it was down at his villa in Sharm el Sheikh and it was so late 2001. And um, in fact, in my book, there's a picture where, you know, he's holding my hand and we're both smiling at the camera Actually, he was crushing it, and I was sort of, can you let go of my hand, please, President? Um, he was a very powerful guy in every sense. And he was, the, the, the interview consisted of him lecturing our audience in Britain, saying, I told you so, these Muslim fundamentalists, they're going to be trouble, I told you so, now look what's happened, etc. You know, his, his sort of, his whole outlook was one of, it's me or Al-Qaeda. You know, if you get rid of me, you're going to have Al-Qaeda. Um, and you know, he always said that there was no alternative to him, essentially, in, in, in Egypt. Um, and as soon as we'd done the interview, he then got his people to bother us every sort of few minutes, saying, well, when's it going to come out? And we had a problem with the satellite feed. And hour after hour would go by with us getting more and more nervous down in this hotel. And it's, the interview still hadn't shown on BBC World. Mr. Mr. Gardner, President Rice, he's very angry. Why it not show? It is now a, come on, where, where, where it show? I, please, it's not good. I am going to get very big problems now for, for you. And um, so, you know, I was as scared as this guy was because, you know, he could have had us locked up or something. So um, eventually it did go out and that was fine. Um, and he relaxed a bit and we got back to Cairo without being arrested. Um, you've just released your latest documentary film about your return to Saudi mm. Arabia. It's a country you spent a lot of time in. You talk us through sort of, it's such mm. a sort of opaque country that some of us may have opinions of, but not necessarily know. What, mm. what, what sort of stereo, how true are the stereotypes mm. about Saudi Arabia? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I got, you know, to deal with the elephant in the room, I got shot um, rather a lot in Saudi Arabia nine years ago, which is why I'm based in a wheelchair, um, because one of the bullets went through and out the other and one through the shoulder and so on. It's all in the first chapter of Blood and Sand. He says, effortless, plugging his own book here. <laughs> um, um, but um, I didn't go back for nine years um, because of it. This was 2004 that it happened. But I decided this year that it was time to do it. And um, one of the independent production companies approached me and said, look, I think we'd like to do this with BBC Two. You know, Frank Garden has returned to Saudi Arabia. And I went along with it, and the Saudis said, the Saudi embassy said, we will give you every possible help, and then they didn't give us any visas. Um, so, uh, okay, and eventually they said, you might as well give up, you're not gonna get in. But fortunately, we managed to find a prince with influence. In the Middle East, or in the Gulf, it's all about something called wasata, connections, who you know, you know. It's not money, it's not bribery, it's about connections. It's about knowing the right person to call and say, any chance? And that's what we did, and, and we got the right prince. Once we found him, all doors opened, and we spent two weeks there in January and February filming. And it was, um, it was really interesting. Saudi Arabia felt like a much lighter place than when I'd left it uh, in 2004. You know, they more or less defeated the insurgency. It's a, a relatively safe place. Um, yes, there are still some weird things. The justice system is very flawed. Um, human rights is very questionable there. They've got a major problem with unemployment that is just this iceberg beneath the surface um, with so many people who are expecting jobs not getting them. I mean, it's a problem in the West too. Um, and in the moment in Saudi, they're able to kind of buy it off to throw money at it. But it is going to be a big problem because they're failing to generate enough meaningful jobs for Saudis. And as you probably know, some of you might have been there. You know, it's 27 million people of whom 7 million are um, expatriate workers, mostly from Asia and Africa, and they're doing the jobs that Saudis don't want to do. And Saudi employers generally prefer to hire them than Saudis, which is a problem. And the Saudi government is trying to force people to hire more Saudis. And it's, it's, it's kind of, they're resisting. It's going very, it's not going that well. But what I found fascinating was showing bits of it on this film that people didn't expect you know, the kind of joy riding, the um, cruising around Jeddah on a Friday afternoon with Bob Marley blaring at speakers from huge, massive speakers the size of this desk, which I never expected. Um, and I said, you know, but aren't the Mutawa, the, the, the religious police, going to disapprove of this? And they said, no, no, we've got permission. We're allowed to do it. And that was great. And we went quad bike riding in Riyadh um, in the dunes outside. And we, went, we flew in helicopters and stuff. And it was a lot of fun. It was really interesting. 
There was one tricky moment down in Najran on the Yemeni border. And I went off for a pee behind some trucks, at which point I heard two gunshots ring out, a screech of tires and a shout in Arabic. I thought, bloody hell, not again. <laughs> but all it was was some hapless, some shepherd, his, his vehicle, his pickup truck backfired twice, um, the exhaust pipe, and he shouted, him, you know, he was shouting a goodbye to his mate and he was roaring off for his lunch. That was all. But um, the police escort we had were really worried. I think they saw their careers going up in flames. Um, and they, you know, you must never do that again. Don't go out of our sight. You know, we were never in any danger at all. It was a very hospitable place. And as some of you might have seen the film, which went out on BBC Two about two, three weeks ago. It was a one hour documentary on prime time. And we were in this souk in Najran. And they were, this was completely genuine. I checked that this wasn't some sort of set up by the government. It was an absolutely genuine gift from the people of Najran. They presented me with this sort of encrusted dagger. I mean, actually, I don't think it's worth that much because it was quite sort of a little bit tinny, but it was, that's, you know, I'm not slagging it off. It just, it actually honestly isn't worth as much as it looks on the, on the film. And I said, this is amazing. Wow. You know, look, guys, let's get out of here. This is embarrassing. You know, we're going to get given something else soon. And as I was saying that, they presented me with this great big sword. Please, from the people of Najran, you must have this. And I just thought that was so lovely. It was a completely genuine gift. Somebody had told them my story, that I'd been shot in their country, um, and they did it from the goodness of their hearts. And I, you know, I say this with a straight face. Saudi Arabia is one of the most hospitable um, places on the whole planet. Once you get past the, the, the often very unpleasant sort of entry formalities and customs people and people in embassies who are trying to stop you getting in. Once you get into the country and get past that sort of sphincter, so to speak, it is a great uh, place to visit. You talk about how Saudi Arabia things have got lighter since 2004. That's mm. certainly not the case in large parts of the Middle East. How does it feel to see mm. places where you sort of travelled around mm. that are now sort of war zones or have seen revolutions? I mean, surely mm. lots of places you used to visit very freely as a British citizen and now, I mean, you spent time in mm. Syria, for instance. Syria is the, is the obvious one. I mean, it's desperately, desperately sad. Um, and I am, I'm going to say this straight away, I'm not going to get drawn into a bear trap of saying whether we should or shouldn't you know, be involved militarily there. Um, it is, it's really sad because Syria is a country of such an ancient culture um, and a real hodgepodge of different ethnicities as well. There was a place called Ma'alula up in the mountains where there was a monastery and they still speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus there. I recorded somebody speaking it. It's incredible. Um, and it's terribly, terribly sad. Um, but it's weird. It's kind of settled into this awful stalemate where people are dying every day. I mean, today there was a failed assassination attempt to blow out the prime minister. It didn't succeed, but people were injured very badly, possibly killed. Every day there are deaths there. But it doesn't, there's no real end in sight at the moment. I mean, the, you know, I, I flew with Cameron in November from Amman in Jordan up to the Syrian border. And I watched him there on the border with a kind of light in his eyes saying that, you know, the, we've got to do something, but it's being stymied diplomatically. The, you know, the, the UN Security Council cannot agree on how to resolve Syria.